Je m'appelle Drew Fustini, and uh, if you want to, the XCC slides are up there at uh, tinyurl.com slash riskv dash kr22. So there's a lot of links in these slides, so you can get them all there. So I wanted to talk today about Linux on RISC-V. So who am I? I'm a Linux kernel developer at Bayleap. Um, so for those of you that aren't familiar with us, we're an embedded software consultancy based in Nice, and we have about 50 engineers around the world. Um, that contribute to open source software like Linux, U-Boot, Android, and Zephyr. I'm also on the board of directors of the BeagleBoard.org Foundation. You might be familiar with the BeagleBone. It's a small uh, open source hardware single board computer. I'm also on the board of directors of the Open Source Hardware Association, and we have a open source hardware self-certification program that people can do on our website. And I'm also an ambassador for RISC-V International, and I'll be talking about that organization a little bit later. So RISC-V is a free and open instruction set architecture, ISA. It was started by a computer architecture, by a computer architecture research group at UC Berkeley back in 2010, led by Krista Sanovich. Um, the V is the Roman numeral five, so because it's the fifth risk instruction set to come out of UC Berkeley. And the reason why I say it's free and open is because the specifications are published under an open source license, the Creative Commons Attribution License. So what's different about RISC-V? It's not the first open instruction set, um, but there are some things about it that make it um, special and unique. Um, so it's a simple, clean slate design. So it tries to avoid any dependencies on the microarchitecture style. Um, and it's also a modular design. So potentially it's suitable for everything from a small microcontroller all the way up to a supercomputer. But it has a stable base, which is quite important. So the base integer ISAs that I'm going to tell you about and the standard extensions are frozen, so those won't change. So additions to RISC-V are made via optional extensions, but not new versions of the ISA. So we have uh, base integer ISAs, um, starting with RV32i, um, which is 32-bit, and it's less than 50 instructions. Um, so it's ideal for both small embedded applications and also for education, since the group that came up with this at Berkeley, in addition to their research, they also taught undergrads. So this was good for that use case as well. Now RV64i is the 64-bit um, ISA, integer ISA, and that's going to be the one that's most important for Linux. There's even RV128i, um, and that's kind of to feature-proof the address space. It's not implemented yet, but it's in there uh, in the specification for future um, use. So the base integer registers, um, there's 32 of them, um, and you'll see a term called xlen in the documentation, the specifications. Um, so that defines the register width. So for RV32i, the xlen, the xlen is 32, and for RV64i, the xlen is 64. Um, in addition to the 32 registers, x0 through x31, there's also a dedicated piece program counter. Um, and if you want to learn more about the instruction encoding, there's a great talk from Andrew Waterman, who was one of the original creators of RISC-V. So you normally don't see them described as X1 through X31. Um, from the processor's perspective, they're general purpose, but with the processor-specific ABI, we tend to use different names for them um, according to how we, how we use them in the calling convention. So in addition to those base integer ISAs, there's several standard extensions. So there's M for integer multiply and, and divide. There's A for atomic memory operation. So this is important for a operating system like Linux, especially running on a multiprocessor system. There's F, D, and Q for different precisions of floating point. And there's G for general purpose. And this is shorthand for I, M, A, F, and D. And there's also C for compressed, uh, for compressed instructions. So this, instead of 32-bit, it um, takes some of the common instructions and has a 16-bit encoding for them. And that helps save memory and cache. <coughs> So for the purposes of Linux, we're going to be interested in RV64GC because this is what most Linux distributions are targeting. And 2021 was a big year. There had been several specifications that had been in the works for many years. Uh, and then finally, back in December, 15 new specifications were ratified uh, that, that uh, produced more than 40 extensions. Um, some of them that were um, uh, quite interesting is uh, vector, which is um, scalable vector operations. Interesting thing here is it has binary compatibility across different vector links. So um, you can check that, check that out. Um, it's quite interesting. It was inspired by the original Cray uh, vector processing. Uh, 
Um, there's also hypervisor, scalar cryptography, and bitmap that are all new. So one of the things you might notice is this is highly modular and extensible, which is great in terms of you can tailor your microprocessor design to just what you need, but it also creates a large number of possibilities. Like, so how do we deal with all the possible combinations that we can get? So RISC-V Profiles is trying to deal with that by creating a smaller subset with just the common use cases. Uh, so currently, um, they're trying to define RVM, which is for microcontrollers, and then RVA, which would be for application processors, so a full operating system like Linux. Um, this is still in the works. It hasn't been ratified yet. Hopefully sometime this year, the profiles, the initial set of profiles will be ratified. If you want to learn more about the RISC-V ISA, um, there's a great book called the RISC-V Reader. It's available in several languages. It's only about 100 pages, so it's a great way uh, to get up to speed quick. And some of you might be familiar with this book. It's a pretty famous computer architecture book, and it now has a RISC-V edition. If you want to get into how do you actually implement a RISC-V processor. So RISC-V International, so it started at UC Berkeley, um, but now the RISC-V specifications are controlled by RISC-V International. So this is a non-for-profit organization. Uh, it's always growing. Currently, I think it's about 2,700 members, um, including companies and universities from over 70 countries. Um, and you can actually become a member free of cost um, as an individual or if you're part of a non-profit organization. Uh, one of the ways I've learned a lot about RISC-V is from the talks that are on the YouTube channel. There's hundreds from the past years of conferences, so it's a great way to learn more. Um, and companies have actually already shipped billions of RISC-V cores. Uh, one reason is NVIDIA GPUs actually have had uh, RISC-V cores in them for several, use, not several years now for doing system management tasks. Um, and Seagate and Western Digital are using RISC-V cores in their storage controllers. So some of the advantages for industry, for companies with RISC-V is that you don't have to deal with any ISA licensing costs or, or royalties. Um, the, the researchers at Berkeley, one of the reasons they uh, decided to create their own uh, open instruction set is they didn't want to deal with all the delays that might come from negotiating uh, licensing agreements. Um, it also gives companies the freedom to choose their own microarchitecture implementation. So with an, open ISA, with an open ISA, everyone gets an architecture license. And it also provides the freedom to leverage existing open source implementations. So there's a broad range of cores that are already available for everything from small, tiny embedded cores all the way up to high performance, out of order cores. So sometimes I get a question or I hear people ask like, is RISC-V an open source processor? So RISC-V itself is just a set of specifications under an open license. Uh, so risk in very an important distinction here is that RISC-V implementations can be open source or proprietary. So just because it says it's RISC-V doesn't mean the implementation is open source. It could also be proprietary. But open specifications make open source implementations possible. So one of the reasons I'm excited about RISC-V is because an open I say makes it possible to have an open source processor. And there are many open source cores to choose from. Um, some of the popular ones from Academia is Rocket and Boom from the original Berkeley team. At ETH Zurich, they have a great team there called Pulp, and they've been producing lots of interesting RISC-V cores for many years. Um, I mentioned Western Digital. They created a design called Swerve, um, which is a really high-performance microcontroller. Um, and it's now being developed by an industry alliance called the Chips Alliance. Uh, another industry group called the Open HW Group, they're trying to create um, proven and verified IP um, that you can put into your SOC designs. Because one of the challenges here is, even though it's an open source, how do you judge the quality? How do you know that you can plug it into your design and um, go through verification successfully? So they're working on that sort of issues. Um, Google also has Open Titan, which is a silicon root of trust, a security chip. Uh, and they're using the IBEX core, which originally came from ETH Zurich. There's also designs that are great for FPGA soft cores as well. Um, and a great organization in this space is the Fossey Foundation. They're the Free and Open Source Silicon Foundation. And they have a monthly newsletter that talks a lot about open source cores. So I recommend checking that out if you want to um, keep, keep in touch with what's going on. Uh, and then a really exciting thing that really deserves a whole presentation on its own is that you can now build your own open source SOC with open source Silicon software tools. Um, so Google, within the last maybe year and a half, 
Google teamed up with a fab called Skywater um, to open source their 130 nanometer process. So yes, that's not the latest and greatest, but it's quite cool because everything down to like the transistor cells is now open. Um, and Google now offers a free shuttle run and multi-project wafer. So if you design an open source chip, you can submit it. Um, and they, every two months they do about 40 projects. Um, so it's a high likelihood if you spend some time designing something, you'll, you'll get chips back uh, free of cost. Um, so there's links in there if you want to check them out. Um, it's a really exciting thing, and uh, I expect this area to grow a lot. Another thing that's really important for an ISA is the software ecosystem. So like, I don't think there's really been an ISA that's been successful without really wide software adoption. And the good thing with RISC-V is it already has a pretty well-supported ecosystem. Um, all the things you kind of expect um, are there. So, you know, we have Linux, uh, NetBSD, OpenBSD, FreeBSD all exist, FreeRTOS and Zephyr. Um, there's a bunch more. There's also commercial ones as well. Um, for tool chains, we have GCC, GLibC, GDB, Clang, LLVM. Um, so kind of all the things you'd expect on like a, an open source system. Uh, V8 uh, is upstream now for RISC-V, uh, Node.js, Rust, Go. More recently, uh, OpenGDK, including the JIT, is now um, uh, upstream, I believe, and also Python. So pretty much any language or runtime or compiler you can think of um, is now available on RISC-V. Um, there is um, a little bit work. There's definitely optimization work that still needs to be done. And one of the groups that's doing a lot of this is called the PLCT Lab. Um, Another one of the RISC-V ambassadors, Wei Wu, he's um, a director there. And they do a lot of compiler and runtime work. Um, I linked to a report that they just published called the, the last 5%, talking about, you know, we have a lot of software now, but what's the remaining 5% that still needs to be ported and worked on? So something that's really important for if we're going to run a full operating system is the RISC-V privilege architecture. So when I showed the specs originally, there's, there's kind of two volumes. So there's the first volume, which is called unprivileged, which is just that base integer ISA and the standard extensions. And there's a second volume called the privileged architecture. And this assigns, this uh, specifies three privilege modes. Uh, so at the bottom, the most privileged, we have M mode, uh, or machine mode, which is where our firmware would run. And then we have supervisor mode or S mode where our OS kernel would run. And then we have uh, user mode or U mode where the application would run. Um, and then there's an environment call or E call instruction that allows us to transfer control uh, to another privilege uh, level. So our user space program, for example, would issue an E call instruction to make a system call into the OS. Another concept that's import important in the privilege architecture is control and status re registers. Um, so a lot of things are controlled through these CSRs. Uh, they have their own instructions to read and write from them. And they're specific to the mode. So you have CSRs for M mode and you have C CSRs for S mode. Um, and this is an example of machine status or M status um, that has things like uh, interrupt, interrupt enabled, um, privilege level, these sorts of things in there. That you, um, so it's one of the an example of a very important CSR. Uh, in terms of virtual memory, there's a CSR called the Supervisor Address Trans and Tr Translation and Protection CSR. And this is what you use to configure um, virtual memory. So for basic systems, there's uh, three SV32, which is three um, page levels, all the way up to, for 64-bit, it goes all the way up to 57-bit um, uh, virtual address space with a five-level page table. In terms of trap handling, we have exceptions, which are synch happen synchronously, and then we have interrupts that happen asynchronously. Uh, and we have this cause register. So if we're in M mode, we have the M cause res we have the M cause register, and if we're in S mode, we have the S cause register. And this will tell us what happened. So it'll tell us was it an exception that happened, what type of exception, or was it an interrupt, and in what type of interrupt happened. I'm going to take a little look here at kind of the over, overview of how interrupts happen on, on a RISC-V system. So we have local per heart interrupts. Um, so we have the core local interrupter that would uh, deliver both timer interrupts and software interrupts to a heart. And then we have um, another more advanced one called the core local interrupter. Um, the Clint's kind of a more simple version of that. So depending on the system you're on, you might find one of those. And then for the global level, for external interrupts, we have the platform level inter interrupt controller, or PLIC. Uh, and then 
we have kind of these new specifications that are being worked on because there were some shortcomings with that existing scheme of the Clint and the PLIC. Um, one of them being is um, with this advanced interrupt architecture that's being worked on now is the ability to have uh, message signal interrupts, which are necessary for something like PCI Express. Um, it also allows us to address certain shortcomings in that original design. Uh, so th these specs are still being worked on. They're not ratified yet, but that should happen this year. Um, there's also a more advanced version of the Clint that I talked about, and um, this just improves the efficiency of how it works. So common risk five blue, blue flow here is similar to what you might see on other SOCs. We start off with a boot ROM, and in, 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 the, in the case of RISC-V, we're in M mode, the most privileged mode. And then we jump to a first stage bootloader, which might be U-boot SPL or vendor firmware. Uh, then eventually, we're in S mode, and U-boot then loads and jumps to the Linux kernel. But there's something new there in the case of RISC-V, and that's SBI. So SBI stands for the Supervisor Binary Interface. So this is a non-ISA uh, extension. So it doesn't add any instructions, but it defines a calling convention between S mode and M mode. Um, so Supervisor Mode Software, S mode software, like Linux, can be portable across RISC-V implementations because this abstracts away the platform-specific functionality. So rather than having S mode have to understand all the little specifics of every implementation, it, it's abstracted away through this SBI. So you can see here, um, if we are uh, from Linux, which is our operating system kernel that's running in S mode, it would make SBI calls down into the firmware that's running in M mode. And we'll get more into what services that actually provides. Um, and I mentioned it a little bit earlier, um, and I should have probably defined this first, but I used a term called HART, which is not a term I think really exists outside of the, of the RISC-V world. Um, so HART stands for hardware thread. So um, a RISC-V core is defined as having an independent instruction fetch unit. Um, and if that core has multi-threading, then it could contain multiple HARTs. Um, so to give an example here, if we have a RISC-V processor that has two cores, in two hearts per core, then we would have four hearts. So in the case of Linux, Linux would see four processors. Um, so on our boot screen, if we had four hearts, we would see four penguins. Um, so the supervisor binary interface is required by this Unix class platform specification. I'll talk about it a little bit later, but it's going to be replaced by a newer one called the platform specification. And this, this uh, defines these uh, runtime services that are, well, both boot time services and runtime services. So um, things like a timer extension to be able to program a clock, um, interprocessor interrupt um, extension to be able to send um, interprocessor interrupts to other hearts, and then also an instruction to be able to send remote fences to other hearts. On top of that, there are some newer ones um, called the, one is the heart state management. So this allows S mode software like Linux to be able to request to stop, start, or suspend a heart. There's also the system restart extension. So this allows S mode software like Linux to be able to request a system level reboot or shutdown. And the nice thing here is it doesn't have to know all the platform specific functionality to do that. It can just make a call into SBI and says, hey, reboot the system. In addition to that, there's also a performance monitoring unit extension. Um, so this is quite important for being able to use tools like Perf. Um, and there was a great talk by one of the developers recently that goes more into how that works. So I mentioned one of the extensions that was ratified back in December is Hypervisor. Um, so this actually gives us some, some additional modes in here. So we have the Hypervisor Supervisor mode or HS mode. And this is where the host kernel would run. And then we have the virtualized supervisor mode or VS mode. And this is where the guest kernel would run. So we got to have an additional level there. So um, we have on top of uh, M mode, we have HS mode, which is where our host, where our hypervisor essentially be running. And then on top of there, we have VS mode. And that's where our guest kernel would be running. And in between them, we're making SBI calls to have the uh, higher privileged um, mode to be able to do things on the less privileged mode's behalf. So that's just a specification, and the open source implementation that most people are using is called Open SBI. So the idea here is to offer the implementation in layers. So at the core, there's just a core library that implements 
the specification. And then there's libraries that are specific to different platforms and include things like drivers. And there's full reference firmwares that would run on certain platforms as well. Um, so in addition to boot time um, services, it also provides runtime services to S mode software. Um, so it determines what SBI extensions that I was just listing will be available on the system. Um, one of the things that's interesting about RISC-V is that all unimplemented instructions will track. So I mentioned you have all these extensions, you might have your software and your software doesn't necessarily check when instructions are available. So if it tries to execute an instruction that's not implemented, it'll trap. In the case of OpenSPI, it would trap into OpenSPI. And we might do things like um, we could em emulate things like floating point if we wanted to in there. It wouldn't be very performant, but allows us to handle certain cases of backwards um, compatibility. And one of the things that's newer with OpenSPI, so previously you had to add in your own platform for every board and do a, add a bunch of code to OpenSPI, but a newer model is this generic platform. So we don't need to add any new code to SPI for, for each new dev board. And instead we rely on the first stage bootloader to pass a device tree to OpenSPI that describes the platform. And the nice thing here, this allows us to have one OpenSPI binary that can be used across multiple platforms. So Linux distros don't have to compile a separate SPI binary for each individual board. They can just compile one that'll work across any board that's supported by the generic platform. There's also this idea of, S of domain support, which allows us to potentially partition parts between a secure domain and a non-secure domain. Um, which is one of the thing, one of the features that OpenSPI is working on. There's also UEFI support. So UEFI is the standard interface between firmware and operating systems for x86 and ARM64. So it's a very common thing, and RISC-V is trying to embrace those existing standards and adopt it as well. Um, so both U-Boot and Tiano Core EDK2 have implementations for RISC-V. Um, Grub2 can be used as a UEFI payload on RISC-V and their support with the EFI stub and the Linux kernel for RISC-V as well. So one of the things that's unique to RISC-V is the operating system needs to know which heart booted the system. Um, so, and this needs to be known before you're going to parse ACPI tables or DT properties. Um, so on non-UEFI systems, we can just pass that in a register but that violates the calling conventions for UEFI. So there has now been a EFI boot protocol specified for RISC-V um, that'll allow the OS to discover the boot hard ID. Um, that just went through a public review process and a patch has been posted and now merged into Linux. Um, so this will allow UEFI systems to be able to properly determine which heart is booting the system. So I mentioned before there used to be something called the Unix class platform specification that has now been expanded to something more general called the platform specification. So the goal here is to be able to have off the shelf software so we can uh, standardize the interface between the hardware and software and as long as you have a system that says it conforms to the platform specification, you know you'll be able to run software that says it conforms to the platform specification. And that breaks up into a couple different categories. So we have OSA platform and the A as an application, so like an application processor where you're running a full OS like Linux. So we have common requirements and then that breaks down into an embedded platform and a server platform. There's also something called RVM CSI platform and this is meant for bare metal applications or um, uh, running on microcontrollers. So we're not gonna talk too much about that today. So for the OSA common requirements, um, one of the things here is the profiles that I mentioned earlier, which specifies what extensions need to be implemented. Um, and there's just common things like, like debug, uh, timers, interrupt controllers, um, also what SPI extensions need to be implemented. Um, and then if we look at the platform, the embedded platform, so this would be used for something like a single bird computer maybe or a mobile device. One of the key things here is they decided to adopt what's already been commonly used now in the ARM world, which is EBBR, so the embedded base boot requirements. So all the things that that says are also the case for the RISC-V uh, OSA embedded platform. So this allows us to use UEFI with something like U-Boot, and we still use device tree to describe the hardware. Now with the server extension, the goal here is for enterprise distros like, like Rail to just work on a RISC-V server. So it mandates ACPI to describe the hardware. It also calls for certain things like PCA Express, um, like system date and time, some reliability things like ECC RAM. 
Um, and there's now a RISC V ACPI uh, platform uh, specification as well. So let's take a look at that. So um, it defines the mandatory ACPI tables. There's also a few things that were needed for RISC V. So these are actually being, I think, submitted to the UEFI form to get them added. So we need things to describe the RISC V hearts and also some things about the RISC V timers. Um, so the end result of all this is that in, in the future, uh, hardware that complies to this uh, server platform specification will hopefully just work with um, uh, Linux server, uh, like enterprise Linux distros. There is full support in QEMU for RISC-V from 32-bit to 64-bit. Um, there's also even configs for some of the existing dev boards that you can just run the same binaries um, in QEMU that you would on the dev boards. Um, and a lot of the work that's being done on new specifications always gets added to QEMU first. So a lot of the development actually happens on QEMU before there's any hardware available. So the initial port of RISC-V to Linux was done by Palmer DeBelt. He's one of the develop. He was actually part of the original Berkeley team. Um, that was done back in Linux 415 back in 2018. Um, and Bjorn uh, gave a talk uh, about two years ago where he talked about uh, why you should get involved with uh, RISC-V Linux kernel community. And one of the one of the nice things is it's still pretty small. So uh, as opposed to other parts of the kernel, um, it's still a pretty small community. So you can get involved. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting area to get involved in. Um, Palmer is still the maintainer of the RISC-V tree. Um, the development happens on the Linux-RISC-V mailing list. Um, if you don't want to subscribe, you can browse the archives on Lore. Um, and there is also a RISC-V channel on Libera chat. Um, Palmer's on there and some of the other kernel developers. So from time to time, there'll be discussions, especially if there's like conflicts and things like this. Sometimes they'll happen in real time on IRC rather than being on the mailing list. So this was actually something that Bjorn showed in his talk a couple years ago, which is the architecture features list. So there's this shell script that you can run for an architecture in the kernel directory, and it'll show you what features are currently um, exist and what features are still to do. So compared to two years ago, a lot more of these lines say OK. And the ones that say to do, I don't think are maybe that important. So the, the kind of the thing I want you to take away from here is that most things that you can think of are actually already implemented for the RISC-V architecture including eBPF uh, JIT, which is something actually Bjorn had worked on. Uh, so recently, th things that were recently added to Linux, so KVM support was added back in 5.16, um, which was really big. Um, now that we have the hypervisor specification ratified, uh, Anup was finally able to get that merged in. Um, also this uh, SBI system reset extension, um, so this is quite nice because then we can reboot a system without Linux having to have platform specific drivers. Uh, and then new in 5.18 is support for this SV57, which is that five-level page table um, scheme, which allows us to have a virtual address space of 128 petabytes, which should hopefully be enough for everyone, at least for now. Um, there's also now full support for perf. So RISC-V has had perf support for a while, but it wasn't very featureful due to some hardware constraints. So with um, some new in, uh, extension and also an extension in SBI, we can now have full perf like we do on other platforms. So all the fancy stuff that you see Brendan and Greg do, I think you should be able to do on RISC-V now. There's also support using that hard state management extension in SBI to be able to have um, CPU idle and suspend drivers work on RISC-V now. Um, another thing that was interesting is as we add these extensions, uh, the way that they were being described in device tree and then parsed in Linux was, was no longer working because we started having these multi-letter extensions uh, and it just was kind of breaking down. So as of 5, 518, that's all been reworked. So now it can correctly parse these multi-letter ISA extensions so that the kernel knows exactly what capabilities the, the processor has. So as of uh, Monday, I think was the 31st, um, Palmer sent in the part one of 519. Uh, there's a very important thing here called page-based memory attributes, and we'll talk about that in a few slides. Another interesting thing was the capability to run 30, uh, 32-bit uh, user space on a 64-bit kernel. Um, there's some other features, uh, KZEC file, um, uh, kind of new way of doing uh, spin locks on RISC-V um, with these generic ticket-based spin locks um, and some other fix-ups. And it's still possible he might send a part two. Um, so 
You can also, if you're curious about this sort of stuff, you can follow his next tree to see what shows up in there. So there are still things that are important items that are still on the mailing list. The one is support for the vector ISA. So I mentioned that was ratified, so uh, we still need to get support uh, merged in for that. Um, another one is improvements for interprocessor interrupts. So currently there's an issue where um, the M mode runtime has to be, so the S mode software like the Linux kernel has to make a call through SBI into the M mode runtime to issue IPIs. So this is not very efficient. So that new advanced interrupt architecture spec allows S mode software like Linux to issue IPIs directly without having to make that inefficient SBI call into M mode. And this adds support for that. Similar to that, uh, instead of IPIs for timers, this uh, SSTC extension allows S mode software like Linux to be able to uh, set up timer interrupts without having to go through M mode. So just another sort of efficiency gain. So in terms of, so that's the kernel, which is in pretty good shape. Um, so with Linux distros, um, Fedora has been working on RISC V for a while now. One of the other RISC V ambassadors, Wei Fu, he's a Red Hat engineer. He's super passionate about RISC V. I recommend checking out his, this talk here. Um, he's really passionate about getting Fedora to run every single RISC V system that, that ever it gets created. Um, and there's instructions how to run it on QEMU and some of the dev boards that exist right now. Debian has 95% of the packages building right now, which I think is the, the highest percentage for any uh, current port. Um, that's not officially part of Debian. Uh, Ubuntu um, has actually supported it since 2004, but with the 2204, they actually now have a server install image, which is pretty neat. So it, it's like what you normally would expect, like it uses Grub and it boots into an installer and then you, you can install it onto a NVMe drive connected to one of the dev boards. So it's actually kind of like a, a normal system where you have a generic installer. Uh, OpenSUSE uh, is working on support as well and they have some tumbleweed images. Uh, Arch Linux has 95% of the core packages building uh, and Gen2 has RISC-5 64 stages available for download. So if you don't need a full binary distro, Open Embedded and Yocto uh, have the meta RISC-V layer that allows you to um, add support for RISC-V based systems. There's also support in BuildRoot um, and uh, Michael Optenacker, um, who's here, he did a great presentation at a previous FOSTEM that tells you how to build a complete, uh, a complete RISC-V system with like a uh, busy box environment uh, in 45 minutes. So back in 2019, there was the Sci-Fi Freedom Unleashed board, and it was really cool to see a full uh, Linux system with a graphical desktop. Um, but it was $1,000, and the chip on it was never sold separately. So it was really cool to see that, like, wow, you can run a real like Linux system on RISC-V, but it, it wasn't really, um, it was pretty limited in terms of uh, its availability. Uh, but one of the customers of sci 5 is Microchip, and they built this Polar Fire SoC that uses the same RISC-V cores from the uh, Unleashed board, um, but it has an FPGA in it. And this is a full commercial product family, so there will be parts available from distributors. Um, and they do have this dev board. Um, it's still pretty expensive, though, at 500. And then there was this tiny little board, a very inexpensive board, that had a two core, dual core 400 megahertz, 64-bit uh, RISC-V, essentially microcontroller. It has eight megabytes of SRAM and no DRAM, but a few developers um, thought it would be really cool to get RISC-V running on it. So you can actually run a little build, you can use BuildRoot to create a little, a busy box system that you can run on it. So um, because there wasn't too many RISC-V systems available over the last couple of years, um, this was actually quite nice for uh, developers to get their hands on real hardware and it would only cost like $14. Sci-Fi followed up their board with a more capable one called the Unmatched. Um, the neat thing about this is it has uh, M2 slots for NVMe SSDs, and it also has PCI Express. So you can add in a graphics card and have a full like RISC-V workstation here. Unfortunately, they decided to discontinue this at the beginning of this year because of supply chain issues, and they're getting ready for their next gen, but they haven't announced what that'll be yet. Um, so Alibaba has a chip design division called T-Head, and they have designed this C910, which is a high-performance RISC-V um, design that can be up to 16 cores. And they made a test chip called the ICE um, that has two of those C910 cores, which has about, each core is supposed to be about the performance of a Cortex-A73 core. Um, and then they surprised everyone at the beginning of last year, saying, hey, we ported Android 10 to it. 
um, which at the time no one was really expecting Android to run on Risk Five, at least not for a long time. And they did a really good presentation about how they went through the process of porting Android 10 to Risk Five. That you can find out more information in those links. Um, and they also came out with a dev board called the RVB Ice Board. Um, so this has been made in low quantity, and you can get it on AliExpress, but um, there will probably be other boards in the future, but this was for people that are really anxious to get into um, developing Android um, RISC-V systems early on. They've also now set up an Android special interest group in RISC-V International to um, progress this work. Uh, and then on the low end, Alibaba Tihad has this smaller call called the C906. And all winner actually took this small RISC V core and made uh, the first mass production low cost SOC called the All Winner D1. So this has a single one gigahertz RISC V core in it. They have this official dev board for it that's kind of in a familiar form factor for single board computers. Um, this official dev board is about $115 on AliExpress. Um, and this brings up what I wanted to mention is the RISC V developer boards programs. The idea here is to get uh, RISC V International wants to get dev boards into open source developers' hands. So you can fill out this form and describe what project you want to work on um, and potentially get matched with a board. Um, this launched last year with the all winner D1 NEZA board and the Sci Fi board, and they're continuing to do the program. So I highly recommend uh, filling out that form if you're interested in getting hardware. There is a strong open source uh, community for the all winner D1 based on the Linux Unzi community, which has been around for many years. Um, Samuel Howen is one of the developers that's been trying to get mainline versions of U-Boot and OpenSPI and Linux to run on this, and he has branches there um, for each of them. Uh, Wei Fu, who I mentioned earlier, has a Fedora image for the AllWinner D1. Um, and because it's a mass production SOC, there's actually other vendors now that are making boards. So um, there's a company called Sipid from China, and they have the Lychee RV, um, which is this small board here. Uh, and it's as cheap as $22 for 512 megabytes of memory. It comes with this cute little uh, spy LCD on it. And they also have other options like a dock and a panel that you can connect it to as well. So in terms of mainline support for the D1, um, a lot of the existing IP was um, from other ARM SOCs, so that's OK. But there are some uh, issues with the T-head design because it has a few things that are non-standard, uh, the most important one being the MMU enhanced mode, which we need to use many of the peripherals. Um, and this is because it's using a non-coherent interconnect. And until recently, we didn't have a way of describing that in the RISC-V uh, in the RISC-V instruction set. Um, so they decided to use some of the reserve bits in the page table entries to specify cache type. Um, and this conflicts with what ended up being created as the page based memory types extension, which allows us to describe if a memory page is cacheable or non-cacheable, or if it's meant for I.O. memory. So what ended up happening is uh, Heiko Stubner has done a patch series, which has now been uh, accepted and should be in Linux 5.19. So what this does is it implements this official standard for the page table format and then also implements the variant that uh, T had uh, created. And it does this through the Linux alternative framework, which is a really interesting ability to, at boot time, do code patching. So it doesn't have any uh, effect at runtime, um, but we can support two different formats of page table entries that way. Another thing that we need is cache management operations, so like the ability to flush a cache line. Um, this was ratified back in December, um, and there's a patch series from Heiko as well to add support for those instructions to Linux, and also the T-head variant that's in the AllWinner D1. However, this needs to wait for those instructions to get added to GCC, so once that happens, which should be maybe at the end of the summer, that can then be merged into Linux. There's also an IMU that's optional, um, so we don't need it. It helps enhance uh, the ability to allocate memory, but we don't need that to, to boot or even use the display. Uh, and then a really cool thing, T-Had released the RTL, the source code, to all these cores as open source. So you can go look at the actual RTL, the Verilog, for these cores on GitHub. There's also another design in China um, that's being worked on um, by a university there. 
And there's a lab um, in, at the Chinese Academy of Sciences that as an open source developer, you can request access to and, and um, uh, do continuous integration and build your projects on there. And if you don't have any hardware at all, Renode is a really good emulator and it has profiles for a bunch of popular dev boards, including some of those RISC-V boards. And if you want to get involved with RISC-V International, remember as an individual, you can join free of cost. Um, and once you join free of cost, you can join the mailing list and participate in the working group meetings that happen. Uh, and then there, all the talks are up from the RISC-V Summit last year and from RISC-V Spring Week, which just happened two weeks ago here in Paris. And here's some talks that are interesting, I thought, from ELC last year. There's also meetups around the world. Um, so check out community.risk5.org to see if there's one near you. And I run a bi-weekly event called Open Hours. So please come and participate. It's meant to be kind of informal. So join, ask questions, talk about uh, RISC-V specs, Linux patches, these sorts of things. Uh, these are the next two times it'll be happening. and. Uh, that's it. I don't know if I have any time for questions, though. Um, I'm having um, a concern, I would say, that the large number of extensions could create some fragmentation. Um, like we've known on IRM uh, v7 uh, some time ago, for example. Uh, do you see uh, a way that the profiles could uh, address this in the long term? Yeah, yeah, I think that's going to be really important because with all these extensions, you can get this big explosion of possibilities. So um, things like the platform specification says you need to uh, support the RVA profile. So the RVA22 profile, and that has a certain set of extensions. So we can hopefully get these common requirements where it's not all ad hoc. But I mean, that is a danger and there's work to, that's why the profiles exist. But is there a pass forward where some previous extensions become mandatory in new profiles, for example, or I don't know. I mean, um, is there a risk that uh, you deploy a, a machine at home, for example, a development machine, and that in two years it's not possible to upgrade your kernel or your user land on it just because uh, the new uh, requirements are bigger? No, because so uh, because it's modular. Like there might be new extensions, but you don't need to implement those. So like if you compile for like the current extensions, like that'll still work on a new fancy risk five processor ten years from now. Um, that's part of how this whole thing's supposed to work. Also, from the Linux perspective, uh, Palmer will not merge things unless they're frozen in ratified uh, extensions. So in, it's only supported in Linux if it's a ratified extension. And ratified extensions like won't be broken. Like if you're going to add new extensions, they can't go break old old extensions. So that should you shouldn't you shouldn't have that risk of things breaking in the okay. future. Okay. Thank you. They are too shy. Yes. <laughs> um, is there any RISC V machine with a GPU? I think one of the T headboards had some Vivanta GPU, right? Uh, yeah, so the C910 that I mentioned there, um, the one that could run Android, that did have a, a Vavante GPU in it. Uh, I think because they're doing Android, they're probably just running the vendor one. But uh, yeah, maybe Etnaviv would run it. I'm not. I'm not sure. The board is on AliExpress now, so it is possible to get one. So I I believe it's not possible to buy it, or is it? No, it is. Yeah. Uh, well, it, it, it was uh, out of stock recently. Oh, out of stock. Okay. So I believe there is going to be a newer version of it released. Nice. So, yeah. I could be wrong, but I think that the Vision 5 board has a GPU. I'm not certain. I, I looked at it a while ago and uh, I got disinterested no, about it the, because of price, so the, but I'm not sure. The current one is has a test SOC that doesn't have it. A lot, uh, Okay. There is supposed to eventually be a uh, production part that has a GPU, but okay. that's not currently out yet. Okay. <laughs>
But um, some of them have PCI Express, so like the Sci-5 uh, one, so you can add in a graphics card. And I'm sure we'll see more. Um, like for T -head, Alibaba T-Head, I'm sure is going to come out with newer things um, to continue this Android work. Um, is there any SOC which has like extended um, support that it would not be manufactured for like half a year and then disappear? Uh, uh, so micro microchip's the only one right now. So the microchip polar fire SOC, it's a full commercial product family from mi uh, from microchip, and it should have certain like lifetime guarantees. Everything else is kind of like in the ad hoc phase. So microchip's probably the only one you could really depend on for right now. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.